Hi, so we're here with Dr. Schoolcraft at CCRM. Dr. Schoolcraft is one of my heroes in life. Um, <laughs> he is, uh, you know, not only at the forefront of innovation and technology in this field, but also just a, a, a very kind and compassionate um, doctor. And my fertility journey changed radically when, when I came to CCRM. Um, I, I had mentioned before, I had frozen eggs in my 30s. Uh, those eggs didn't work. And then I tried a couple rounds of IVF at other clinics and we were just uh, barely getting any results. And so then I did a deep dive into research. I did a lot of due diligence. And what I found is that um, even at some of the top tier clinics that the emphasis wasn't enough on labs. And this is my opinion, um, but but uh, I, I think that it, 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 there's a lot of um, evidence to support it. So the labs and the technology and the science are just so incredibly important. And I, and I really believed this after I did a bunch of research and then I tried it out. I came to uh, CCRM and I saw Dr. Schoolcraft and the results that I was able to get here were six and seven times better. Um, and so the first thing that I wanna talk about uh, Dr. Schoolcraft is why does CCRM have these higher success rates? I mean, it's a it's thirty three percent higher than. Right. Well, uh, it is it is better, and I think we're challenged in a way because, like you, we get a lot of patients who have already failed elsewhere. So, and essentially, we get other people failures, or we get the tougher cases. But the lab, as, as you cited, I, I think your deep dive into research was spot on because, as I tell all my patients. There isn't that much difference in IVF between clinics with regard to the drugs. In fact, there's really one drug, it's called FSH, whether it's Gomalef, Folistin, Menipir. We really have one molecule that really drives egg production, and most doctors can give those medications properly. The egg retrieval is a fairly mechanical process. We go in and get an egg out of the follicle, but it's not uh, super technically difficult or hard. Um, and then when we put embryos back, I would argue that's a fairly straightforward procedure. So what does that leave? It leaves the six days or so when the egg leaves the body, goes into the lab, is fertilized, is cultured, and then after five or six days, it first of all has to reach the blastocyst stage, which is difficult. It has to be biopsied successfully without hurting it to take a few cells to analyze the chromosomes. It has to be frozen, has to be thawed, and then it has to be transferred, and then we expect it to be a baby. And it's quite gone through a gauntlet of, of, some, of some hurdles. And so we actually pioneered blastocyst culture. We were the first group in the world to grow embryos to the blast stage in what's called sequential media. And then we were the first to do the chromosomal screening. So as IVF has morphed over the last 10 years to most people wanting to grow their embryos out to day five so they can test them to be sure they're healthy, um, blastocyst culture has become crucial because if you can't grow an embryo, you can't test it. And then of course the testing which includes the freezing and thawing is very important. So the lab is what we're really blessed with. We have a great team of human embryologists of the 13 working in the lab. We also have 16 people in the research department and they do all the QC, so they test the media, the protein, the oil, the dishes, the pipette tips to be sure that each batch we get every six weeks isn't embryo toxic and very few clinics even have that testing ability to be sure there's no batch to batch variation. Right. So I could talk for hours, but you kind of get the idea. The lab is a very complicated thing, and it's different at each clinic. I would say almost every clinic uses the same drugs, uses the same technique for right. egg retrieval, and almost none of them do the lab the same way. Right, and uh, I mean, you know, like I, I was saying, at the other places I went, even with younger eggs, I was getting one blast right. total. And here, I've gotten six and seven. Yeah. Um, and, that, that gives you the chance, right? I mean, that gives you the material to work with. It, it is a numbers game, and you've got to get embryos to not get so stressed that they fail to grow to the blast. Otherwise, for that embryo, the game's already over. Once you get to the blast, you still have to get lucky and have it have the right chromosomes. But the more you can test, the better your odds get. Right. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I, I just, I, I can't, say enough how critical this discovery has been in my process, and I believe it would have been critical in my egg freezing process as well. Um, no question, uh, the, the freezing of eggs is very technically demanding, and they are more fragile, I guess you could say, or more sensitive even than embryos, mm -hmm. so I, I agree. 
Um, so the, the first kind of question, and a lot of the questions that I got um, when I when I polled, is about egg freezing, and so this is something I feel very strongly about uh, educating to the best of my ability because um, it's important, and you have women that are really doing this and and, and need these good results. So um, obviously, the lab is of critical importance. It is, and egg freezing to youngsters, 25 and 30 year olds. Sounds like a commodity. Everyone's advertising, we freeze eggs, we freeze eggs right. for, for $89.95 or whatever. It's almost, it sounds uh, like, a, like a deal. Right. And of course, that's interesting, except some of these clinics have never thawed an egg and had a live birth. They've simply put eggs in the freezer. In fact, there are some clinics out there that do egg freezing but say, we won't thaw your eggs. When you go to use them, you'll have to take them to another place an IVF clinic to have them thaw and made into embryos. Well, how in the world could a clinic know if their egg freezing works if they've never thawed those eggs, fertilized them, seen them grow to blast, and actually implant and make a baby? And so the number of live births with egg freezing is the first question a patient should ask to validate how good is the lab they're going to. Um, awesome, that's, that's really great uh, data to have. So what do you think are, is the ideal range of age to freeze eggs? Yeah, it's a conundrum because, as I always tell a lot of ladies, uh, it, it would be ideal to freeze your eggs around age 30. Mm -hmm. But at 30, everyone is young and invincible. <laughs> and they all think, I'm bulletproof, right. I'm never going to get old, and of course I'm going to get married and have all the babies I want. At 35, often the notion comes to them, Maybe that egg freezing thing is something I should think about, but oh well, I'm still feeling pretty good about things. And then about 38 or 39, this wave of kind of urgency sets in and they go, oh my gosh, that idea that crossed my plate at 30 and I thought more about 35, I need to rush out and do it tomorrow. The problem is they've reached a point where their egg quantity and quality is quite a bit lower than it was at 30 or 35. So I think everyone who isn't married at 30, who wants a family, and who would be interested should at least test their ovarian reserve. If they go in at 30 and they have what's called an FSH level, an AMH level, and on ultrasound their eggs are counted, and the doctor says, boy, you have an incredibly great supply of eggs, you are gonna be fine till you're 35, maybe they can wait a little longer. If they learn at 30 that, wow, I'm someone who genetically has eggs declining faster than normal, the doctor will probably say, and you better go get those eggs now to be safe. So I think they should look into it starting at 30 and at least assessing where their eggs are on the aging curve is important. Yeah, so I was, I was talking about this uh, earlier today, how we go to get our yearly checkups um, yes. and we get you know paps and, and all that stuff, but there's very little protocol um, suggested to check our fertility markers. You're so right. In fact, uh, Mandy Katz Jaff, who's our genetics director, um, and I kind of went on a campaign a couple years ago to, to kind of enlighten OBGYNs to say, look, ovarian reserve assessment is something you should be offering single Absolutely. women. And most of them were like, wow, that's a great idea, but it's not something we were trained to do or we typically discuss. And so we're trying to get the word out but I think in the meantime, patients have to be their own advocates. They have to say, thanks for my birth control pills, thanks for doing my pap smear, I'm glad I'm healthy. By the way, I wanna assess my eggs, and I've read if I can have an AMH and an FSH and an ultrasound, I can learn more about my egg stats. Sometimes they'll have to push a little to get that data or request it. I can't stress how much I think that that is valuable, valuable information. I have friends that started uh, having declining ovarian reserve very early, and they didn't know it until the, the, you know, until the tail end of it. And they're often told, your exam's fine, don't worry. Right. Don't worry you're young, don't worry everything's right. probably great. But no one actually knows how their eggs are, are aging. Right, so AMH and FS, FSH are blood tests. And, and, and coupled with that, an ultrasound can literally count the number of resting follicles. Those three things together, uh, could give them a very good idea of where they are. Yeah, and I'll put, I'll put that in a post as well, just so people have that information. Yeah. Um, so uh, some other questions we're getting here. Um, 
does being on the pill hurt our chances to conceive later? No, no, it's a myth. Uh, it doesn't. It doesn't help either. I've heard people say the opposite. It saves all my eggs because I'm not ovulating those. That's not how it works. But it certainly doesn't hurt your fertility. Okay. Um, are there things that we can do to improve our fertility and to pr improve egg quality? Well, the first thing is to do no bad stuff and, and smoking uh, higher volume. Sorry, so I'll speak louder. Um, smoking is probably the first thing that can affect eggs and sperm. So not smoking, and that includes marijuana here in Colorado, folks. Um, that's important. Uh, trying to have a normal body weight. Um, and then minimizing or at least going light on alcohol and caffeine. These are just lifestyle things. If people ask about a diet, there's all this crazy stuff about dairy's good, dairy's bad, gluten's good, gluten's bad. But what you could generalize in somebody who doesn't have celiac disease is a Mediterranean diet or something on that order, which is full of antioxidants, low in saturated fat, is a good diet. And then there is some data that certain antioxidants can help egg quality. And we did a study on one very potent antioxidant. It's a form of the acai or acai berry. Um, and that's been very promising in a study with women getting about 30% more eggs on average. Another antioxidant that was studied by a Canadian group is coenzyme Q10 or CoQ10, and it's probably worth taking as well. So lifestyle, weight, smoking, diet, um, antioxidants, those would be the, the, the hallmarks of helping your eggs. Yeah. And I can attest to uh, using that acai supplement here, and I definitely, that, that was the round in which we got a normal embryo and, and more awesome. eggs. Yeah. So cool. Um, very cool. And that's what also what I like about coming here is the, the other places I went to, it was kind of like, okay, here's the protocol. I will keep, you know, and, and instead of changing things up or trying different things, it was just like after a couple rounds, well, you should maybe think about other choices. And, and since I've come here, we've, you know, we've kind of run the gamut, right? We've tried all different things and, and we've gotten a normal embryo and it never seemed like we are ever gonna get there, but. Um, yeah. But your, your tenacity, which is, yeah, is why well, you have it. And it's like our, both CCRM and me together. Um, so what role does stress or trauma play? You know, it's poorly understood because it's poorly measured. I think we really are still lacking a, you know, a meter where we can stick somebody's finger in and get a reading of 40 or 60 or 100 on the stress meter. But we know it, it creates vasoconstriction, which decreases blood vessel uh, diameter, so de less blood flow to your ovaries, less blood flow to your uterus. Uh, you know, stress can cause hypertension, it can cause migraine headaches, ulcers, so it can cause a lot of damage to the body. You can't really worry about stress because it's a circular thing, but to the degree that you can create a window in time where you're not taking on new burdens, work isn't overly demanding, and at least your stress is, for you, as manageable as you can make it, I think is wise. Yeah. Um, I, I know that you have acupuncturists mm -hmm. that you work with, yeah. um, that you believe in, and also um, we talk a little bit about meditation and some of these these tactics that can bring down the nervous system, that can, that can right. calm and quiet the mind. Right. Um, if for nothing else, to have a little bit more peace in the process. Yes, absolutely. Well, and you know, it's, a, it's sort of anecdotal, but everyone I think probably knows of someone who literally tried for years right. and at some point almost gave up. Um, they went on vacation. They said, fertility is in the rear view mirror. I've got to move on life. And what happens? They get pregnant. I have a lot of friends. And you're thinking, that's a very strange coincidence. The, fine, the time you let go of this burden and de-stress, suddenly your body worked. So I think we know there's something to that. Absolutely. So how long do you think is a, a good amount of time to try to get pregnant before you come in to try to get help? Um, ASRM, our national society, recommends um, just waiting only six months if you're after 35 or older than 35. Women under 35, they would argue, could try for up to a year before seeking help. But we see some patients who haven't tried for a year and they're just so anxious about their infertility and so frustrated already that they want at least some testing. They may not start treating for right. it yet, but at least they want an evaluation to know, are my tubes open, am I ovulating, does my husband have adequate sperm, am I even in the ball game here to have a chance? Right. And so I think it's whenever they're that stressed that they want answers certainly more than a year if they're under 35 and six months of trying if they're um, 
older than 31. Right, and and even if you're out of state, you can call CCRM, set up a phone consult. Right, and we can kind of tell you, is it time to get tested? And right. so we can arrange to set that up. We call it a one-day workup. You can literally come in for one day and really learn everything you need to know about your fertility potential and what treatments, if any, would be the best fit. Yeah, you know, it, in so many ways, fertility is in the dark, you know, and you just feel somewhat powerless over this whole process. And so having conversations like this, which you can impart real action steps to empower yourself, to advocate for yourself, I mean, that, that was a game changer for me. And I think CCRM is just an incredibly comprehensive place to, to, to learn about your body and learn what's going on. Um, and, you know, I, it, it's not out of reach. People can call. And, and there's also, what, 11 different locations? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I give you credit for doing these kind of things because I've had other high-profile folks that the public knows, and they've gained great inspiration from having stories like yours shared because it makes their situation real. Yeah. They can identify with it. And in many cases, it stimulates patients to, to go get help. Yeah. Or in the case of Juliana, who some of people know is a patient here, it inspired them to get mammograms again, check for breast cancer. So no question. You, you are uh, a voice to folks, and you kind of legitimize, I think, for a lot of people who think they're in the closet and no one else knows about their infertility, it kind of gives it relevance. It normalizes it, yeah, yeah. for sure, absolutely. Um, so what? I, another question that was brought up is, does constant exposure to technology affect fertility? If you're referring to computer screens and cell phones, uh, no, there's no evidence that that low-level radiation causes infertility. We do tell men if they use a laptop and it's sitting right on their lap for hours a day due to the heat, that might not be ideal, but that would be the only uh, modification. Use a, use a desktop or put the laptop on, on a desk. Okay, um, how are we on time? We're good, 12 or four? Yeah, we have a couple more. Okay, okay. cool. Um, so, we had a lot of questions about miscarriages. Yeah. And what are, you know, how common are miscarriages and what are some of the main culprits or the main culprit? Well, miscarriages are very common. In fact, fertile women uh, often miscarry as, long, as often as one out of four pregnancies, and yet they go on and have two or three kids. But it's an ever-increasing problem. As female age gets older, the egg that they're ovulating is getting older. If they're 30, their egg is 30. If they're 35, it's 35. And the older the egg, the more prone it is to divide its chromosomes improperly right before it fertilizes. The embryo is then chromosomally abnormal and they miscarriage. So, so miscarriage rates vary. At age 30, they may be 20%. At age 40, they may be 50%. Right. And that goes into what causes miscarriage. About 80% of miscarriages are, the, you could say, the embryo's fault. The embryo is chromosomally abnormal. It's going to fail in any body. Even if that embryo was put in another woman, a gestational carrier, it would miscarry. 20% of the time, the embryo is okay, and it is the uterine environment. So when people have had two or three miscarriages or more, we typically do a workup to be sure their uterus isn't the cause. They don't have fibroids, polyps, adhesions. They don't have an immune issue. They don't have a hormone deficiency, a thyroid problem, et cetera. And if we work all that up and say, your body looks like you should be able to carry an embryo just fine then we typically think it's the embryo. And often IVF, where you can screen the embryos and put an embryo back that you already know before they get pregnant, has the right chromosomes to go full term, is for them the answer. Yeah. In fact, again, we talked that we invented that technology. Well, early on we did a study in recurrent aborters, people with three or more miscarriages. We did chromosomal screening. When we put one of those embryos back, the miscarriage rate was 6%. Wow. So very low in people that were notoriously miscarried before they wow. had their embryo screen. Wow. So it's a game changer. It is a game changer. And, and this kind of brings me to my next topic, which is um, getting pregnant after 40. Yeah. Um, a lot of people want to know if it's too late. Um, and this is kind of what we're talking about, right? Um, that are a, a, a significant percentage of our, our eggs are chromosomally abnormal by yeah. this. But what IVF does to solve for this, right, is we're able to produce more than one egg in a cycle, right. a batch of eggs, and then fertilize those eggs and test them and 
can't pick which of the embryos are normal. So That's right. it gives women a, a real chance after 40, right? Right. We, it's not too late. We do get live births up to age 46 with someone using their own eggs. And after 46, certainly with egg donor, it's very successful. But at 40, you're not close to the outer limit of 46 where people's own eggs still work. But it's important at that age to get your fertility assessed quickly because you don't have time to waste. Right. And then secondly, um, if you're very serious about fertility, I would argue compared to, to trying on your own, which is one egg a month, and Unfortunately, if you get pregnant and it's an abnormal embryo, you're pregnant three months, you have to recover from a miscarriage, you lose six months, and at 40 and beyond, that's precious time that isn't really affordable. So I think IVF, where, like you said, you can sort of cheat nature. You can get 13 eggs in one month instead of one, and you can pick the one golden embryo. Almost gives you a year's worth of opportunity in one month, right? and you can really fast track time. Yeah. So. Uh, you know, what I, what I would say to women uh, that are wondering about um, getting pregnant after 40, it's not the easiest road a lot of times. No. Um, <laughs> but, um, you know, like in my case, I, I this is important. And, and when something's important, you, you, you're in for the long haul. And it, it's, it's difficult, it's expensive, um, but it, it can absolutely be done. You know, if, if where there's a will, there's a way. Um, it's not a guarantee, but um, but I think, but again, even more critical to come to a place that can take care of uh, and grow these embryos to give you a real chance to see which ones are viable. I wouldn't have gotten there at those other clinics, yeah. producing one um, blastocyst. Right. It just wouldn't have happened. It would have, you know. It'd be a long haul. <laughs> I'd have run out of time. Yeah. Um, so we talk a lot about uh, IVF and basic can you just kind of give us a brief summation of, of what that is and sure well it stands for in vitro fertilization in vitro means in the petri dish or in in glass technically and the steps are really threefold um, taking medication for about 10 days to sort of trick your ovary into making one egg instead of making one egg to make possibly 10 eggs and then rather than let those eggs pop out of the ovary or ovulate and find their way into the tube we actually go in with the needle and we pull the egg out of the ovary. So we have the egg in a petri dish. We fertilize it. We let as many of those grow to embryos as will grow. And then, as Molly described, we can, before we freeze the embryo, we can test each embryo for chromosomal status. So we're creating multiple eggs through the drug, step one. Step two, we're going in and retrieving the egg. And then step three, we're growing and testing embryos. The final step then is once we have a good embryo, we simply transfer it back into the uterus with a little tiny catheter. Uh, it's analogous to having a pap smear. It's a painless procedure. There's no anesthesia, no surgery. That's super easy. So the challenge for the woman is quite honestly taking the drugs for 10 days. They're shots, so not exactly the most fun you've had. <laughs> the egg retrieval, however, I would argue is pretty routine because you're asleep, so it's, it's not painful. And when you wake up, you're a little crampy, a little bloated, but we've used just a needle to get the egg, so it's not a traditional surgery with a, an incision. So those are the highlights of the procedure. Um, and are, are people want to know about birth defects associated with IVF. That's a tricky one. So if you look at the data, there's about a 3% higher rate of birth defects in IVF children than babies born naturally. But epidemiologists have looked at this data over 20 years and realized that it's probably not the IVF procedure, but the patients, which kind of makes sense. If you're dealing with IVF patients who may be on average 39 years of age, and after all, they have infertility, their husbands may have sperm issues, uh, they may have egg issues. Their sperm and eggs may make more abnormal embryos than fertile couples who on average are 28 years old and get pregnant on their own. So when they found later that people with long histories of infertility who were waiting to do IVF but got pregnant naturally, had the same 3% higher rate of birth defect, they realized it was the status of the patients doing IVF uh, that led to this 3% higher risk, not IVF. So in other words, if you're 39 and you're infertile, the slightly higher rate of birth defect would apply to you no matter how you got pregnant, natural, insemination, fertility drugs, IVF. So the procedure itself doesn't seem to alter the chance to have a healthy baby. Are those birth defects that, um check for with CCS testing? 
Some are, uh, many are chromosomal, and, and certainly that data wasn't in patients who all had CCS. So some of their babies born had chromosomal errors, and those would be screened out with CCS. However, there are birth defects that occur that are non-chromosomal. People have heard of cleft lip or cleft palate or spinal cord defects like spina bifida, um, and those are structural defects, but can't, can't be screened out at the embryo level. Got it. Um, and then, let's see. And I mean, I think you just covered this, but there are, uh, there's a higher risk of birth defects as you age. Yes, and, and to a the large extent, the larger defects with age are just chromosomal, so IVF really uh, negates right. that. Right. It's a game changer. For sure. And then um, we just have a couple more questions. Uh, is egg freezing possible with PCOS? Absolutely. In fact, some ways those patients have an advantage because for, for the price of of an egg freezing cycle, <laughs> they make a lot <laughs> more eggs in the freezer than the average person. Right, so, right. In, in some ways, but you have to be very careful. The doctor has to be very careful with the medication because those patients are at risk for over responding and what they call ovarian hyperstimulation. So, right. there's some caution required. Awesome. Well, I just appreciate you doing this so much. Oh, yeah, this was fun. Yeah, yeah. my first ever live Instagram. Oh, my gosh, well, you did amazing. I'm, uh, <laughs> You're a natural. Yeah. yeah. I'm gonna get my own channel. Yes, actually, I'll put my, I'll put my golf swing. On here. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so I just I can't say enough about how grateful I am that I found CCRM and, and oh, that geez. I went into your office and you were the first doctor that said let's give it a try instead of let's consider other options. Oh, before we go, I just I do want to um, cover one other thing: uh, donor egg. Can you just kind of give a brief overview of donor eggs? Well, and what that you know. Looks like? There, unfortunately, and I'm, I'm known as the brutally honest doctor, when people don't have a, a chance to have success, I will be honest with them. The last thing I want to do is lead them through expensive and painful treatments for not. And, and when people reach that point, um, know, know that I will give them an honest assessment. Is it their first choice? Never. But if you face a point where either you're not going to have a baby, or you could have a baby with egg donor, or you could adopt, I think egg donor has a lot of merit. Um, but you are, at the end of the day, combining an egg from a donor who is matched to you physically, ethnically, you would know their education level, their, uh, their employment, if they're athletic, if they're musical, artistic, a lot about their background. They're screened genetically, they're screened for infectious disease psychologically, and those eggs would be fertilized with your husband's sperm. You would carry and deliver the baby. Um, so in my opinion, it's a fantastic option and it's an incredibly successful, about 75% of those women have a baby on the first try. But if you're honest, every woman would go into that saying, I don't know, this doesn't feel good, this doesn't feel comfortable. So to be honest, it's, it's something people do reluctantly because they think it's the best option that they still have left to have a family. They then get pregnant, and once they get pregnant, it's the same story over and over. Dr. Skullcrap, why didn't you tell me this? This is the best thing ever. You should have told me I was going to be so happy. And I say, I tried, but how would I <laughs> let you experience pregnancy even for a day until you did it? Well, you're right. But boy, can I tell someone else? They, they want to be advocates for other patients yeah. to say, I was in your shoes nine months ago. I didn't want to do donor either at that point. Now I'm the happiest woman on the planet. So. Once you're pregnant and you realize without your uterus and your body, this baby wouldn't exist, it's incredible. But I think, to be honest, none of us are good enough to convey that experience. It, it's a leap of faith, you have to do it, and just realize once you're pregnant, you'll feel the way all these other women do. So I'm a big proponent of egg donor, but I realize for everyone, it's, it's kind of a last option, and, and rightly so, rightly yeah, so. Absolutely. Okay, cool. Well, thank you so much. I'm going to put information um, on how to get in touch with CCRM and some of those uh, fertility tests that we talked about in the beginning. And thanks, Dr. Schoolcraft. You're welcome. Great to see you. Yeah, thanks see for you. joining us. Of course. You're doing okay? Yeah, I'm good. Good, good. Yeah.